I'm going to give you a very warm welcome this morning. Uh, we're going to start just by having a very short reading from the Word of God. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 3 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So we're going to sing a hymn that's based on, on that song. It is number 34. It's one that you can't see in sitting down. It's stand up and bless the Lord, ye people of his choice. Number 34. <laughs> that's all we have got this week because on Wednesday there's no toddler group because it's school holiday and in the evening um, there'll be no meeting this week because so many people won't be able to be there um, it's quite a lot of people away this week uh, but next Sunday we meet at 11 o'clock and just a reminder to members a week next Saturday there is a, a members meeting here in the morning. Thank you, Stephen. 
Um, we're going to sing our next hymn, which is, is 748 <coughs> in the hymn books. It's a, a hymn by <coughs> John Newton, the famous converted slave trader. And it's, it's one of those hymns that kind of brings you down before it takes you back up, if you know what I mean. It's one of those that speaks about the trials and sufferings in the Christian life, but also the, the hope that we have. And I hope that it will be of some comfort to those of you who are going through great trials and difficulties at the moment. So it's, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love in a, and every grace. <laughs> Exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. 
Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigour, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigour. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Puah. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stalls, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, because they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt, with, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. We trust that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. Well, let's spend a few moments praying for our nation and for, for other issues that concern us. Let's all pray together. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you for this privilege of prayer. And though you are a God who speaks to us through your word, you are a God who listens to us, who inclines your ears to your people. We thank you for the great love that you have demonstrated towards us in Jesus Christ. That though we came into this world dead in sins, though we came into this world with that great propensity to sin and and do nothing that is pleasing in your sight. Yet, dear Father, you sent your Son into this world to be the Saviour of many. We thank you, dear Father, that so many of us today can testify of your grace in our lives. You have not looked upon us as our sins deserve, but have looked upon us with such benevolence and kindness and grace. You have lifted us up out of the, the mire of our sin. You have seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You have made us kings and priests together with him. You have granted us an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. And we confess, O oh Lord, that we are deserving of nothing, nothing except your eternal wrath and condemnation. And yet how we thank you for your grace and mercy. We long, O oh Lord, to see others turning to you in repentance and faith. We thank you, Lord, that the, the gospel message that was conceived in eternity is still every bit as relevant today. We thank you, Lord, that the day of salvation is still upon us, mm. that all who seek the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm. And how we pray that you would look with mercy upon our, our nation as a whole. We pray for our King, currently suffering with cancer and we pray our Lord that you would be near to him we pray that you would bless him physically but we pray even more that you would bless him spiritually that you would save his soul he seems to have a, a rather confused understanding of spiritual things and we pray that you will help him to see things clearly and that he will seek you and find you and be found of you we pray Lord for the king and royal family our government and parliament that we may uh, continue to be able to leave lead godly and peaceable lives. We pray, Lord, for great wisdom that you might enable our, 
politicians to uh, pass laws that are, are in keeping with your law and uh, are helpful to your people and to the nation at large. We pray that we might continue to have this liberty to meet and to preach your gospel, both within a building like this or upon the streets, until the Lord Jesus returns in glory. We think, Lord, of our own church here, and we thank you for those who established it and keep kept it going, those who have laboured diligently, sometimes in very difficult and trying circumstances, very thankless circumstances perhaps, and they have laboured diligently, and we pray that you would richly bless them. We pray, dear Father, that you would cause this church to grow, not only numerically, but also spiritually. There might be a deeper love for the things of Christ, of each one of us. We pray, dear Lord, for the forthcoming members meeting. There may be difficult issues to discuss, difficult decisions to be made. And we pray that you would lead and guide everyone. We pray, dear Lord, that we might see more coming forward for baptism and membership, that truly the, the membership of this church would grow. But yet, dear Father, we pray that we might also see that the needy and lost fleeing to us as they would to a city of refuge to hear that wonderful gospel of redeeming grace. We pray that the gospel would be preached here until <coughs> Jesus Christ returns. We pray for those suffering. Indeed, Lord, we, we might say, who amongst us is not suffering? in some form or another, but yet we remember those suffering particularly acutely at the moment. I pray for Mike and all his various health issues and what a difficult 18 months he's had. Uh, so much loss and, and pain and heartache and, and physical ailments. Dear Father, we pray that you would be with him, that you would, you would restore him physically, but yet also you would keep him spiritually. Thank you for his great testimony uh, of your grace and love and working in his life. We pray for each other though, dear Father. You know our own specific needs, the trials we face, the difficult circumstances we live in, the anxieties and cares that we have for the future. Oh dear Father, we, we lay them upon you. We thank you that your word says that we can cast all our cares upon the Lord Jesus, for he cares for us. Indeed, Lord, we Think of unsaved loved ones, family members, sons and daughters, grandchildren, <clears throat> aunties and uncles, cousins, and people we interact with on a daily basis who at present are, are away from you and outside of your kingdom. And Oh dear Father, we pray that you would have mercy on them. We think of many who perhaps in the time past have professed Christian faith and yet have wandered so far from you and it seems that have perhaps have irretrievably fallen. And yet we know, dear Lord, that nobody who is truly saved can irretrievably fall. Uh, you are God who is able to restore, and you do restore. And we pray that you'll restore such folks. And yet, Lord, again, we, we cannot pray enough for the lost. And we, we bring this village and locality to you. And we pray that you might even be pleased to, to pour out your spirit in this part of the country many might seek you, not just the ones and twos, but the great multitudes. Oh dear Lord, we pray for nothing less than a revival by your Holy Spirit. We may feel that we're in days of small things. We may feel that you've largely finished your work. Oh Lord, uh, we believe in you, but help our unbelief. And we pray, dear Father, that we might see such great blessing in this land, the likes of which has never been seen before. And so, dear Lord, we ask you to be with us and bless us, particularly as we hear your word. May we be encouraged. May we be built up in our faith. May we leave this place saying that it was good to be in the house of the Lord. And so we ask all these things in our Saviour's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, before we consider a part of the word, we'll sing a... A rather more positive hymn now, which is 136, if you're using the hymns. Sing praise to God, who raised the God, the God of all creation, the God of wonders, power and love, the God of our salvation. Yeah. 
man of course quickly fell into sin. And we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that first promise, if you like, of the gospel, but also promise of hostility between God and the evil one. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. From that time onwards, there would be extreme hostility between the seed of the serpent, we might say children of the devil, and the seed of the woman, children of God. And we see that very quickly in the book of Genesis, developing two cultures, murderous Cain and faithful Abel. We see the flood, a faithful Noah against a faithful gen faithless generation. And then we move into the promises to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Two of those key promises to Abraham being that he would have innumerable descendants and a land for them to dwell in. Well, as you, you know, I'm sure Abraham goes on to have two sons, Ishmael to the Egyptian maidservant Hagar, and Isaac to his wife Sarah. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. God's promises are to be fulfilled through the line of Jacob. Jacob himself has 12 sons, and 11 of these are listed here for us in verses one to or verses two to five. Eleven plus Joseph. Joseph, I'm sure as you remember, was loved and favoured by Jacob more than his other brothers. And Joseph became incredibly foolish and insensitive towards his brothers, telling them all about his dreams, um, where he said that the sun and moon would bow down before him and he would reign over his brothers. Well, you know how the story goes, I'm sure the brothers were extremely unhappy about that. They decided they were going to kill him. They put a, his body in a pit, blaming it on a wild animal. Eventually agreed to sell him to some Midianite traders. Joseph ends up in Potiphar's house. He does well. He's entrusted with great responsibilities. He resists the advances of Potiphar's wife, but on one occasion she entraps him so that he... It looks like he's attempted to rape her. Well, Joseph's thrown into prison, but he's shown mercy. Prison governor gives him great authority. He then sees, comes across Pharaoh's chief butler and baker, also thrown into the prison. He's able to interpret their dreams. The butler will be spared and restored to life. The baker will be hanged. And word gets out to Pharaoh that this man can interpret dreams and uh, two years later, Joseph is called upon to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. That there would be seven years of plenty throughout the land of Egypt, and then seven years of famine. And Joseph advises Pharaoh to select a wise man to store up food during the seven years of plenty to use during the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh appoints none other than Joseph himself to this task gives him dominion over the whole land of Egypt, effectively making him Pharaoh's second in command. Well, we're getting, we're nearly there. The years of famine arrive. All nations come down to Egypt to see Joseph to buy grain as the famine was so severe, including 10 of Joseph's brothers. Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him. And he puts them into prison for three days on charges of spying. He releases them on condition they bring Benjamin to him and keep Simeon as a hostage. Well, as I'm sure you know, they eventually return with Benjamin. Joseph receives them, them into his house and receives, releases Simeon, sends them on their way back to Canaan and plants a cup in Benjamin's sack. Joseph's steward catches up with them, the cup is found, the brothers return to Joseph's house. Benjamin becomes Joseph's slave while Judah offers to take his place. And there's that great scene where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers then tells them to go and get Jacob and for all of them to settle in Egypt. There were still five years of famine left at that point, but Egypt was a land of plenty. So Jacob... And his sons settle in Egypt. And this is where we take up the narrative 
in Exodus 1. Joseph and his brothers have now died. The people of God are numerous. They're in a land of plenty. But they're not in the promised land. Now God has been faithful to his promises. Remember he promised Abraham that Abraham's descendants would be numerous, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, and they would become a nation. And we're told in verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was full of them. They were numerous. The commission given to Adam, and then to Noah to be fruitful, to multiply and fill the earth, is being fulfilled by the people of God. The promises of God made to Abraham and to Jacob that he would make them into a great nation are being fulfilled. God has established for himself a people, a people precious to him above all the peoples of the earth, a people who would be subject to his loving kindness and protection. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, probably some 1800 years later, also came into a foreign land. He came from his glory into this world. He preached the gospel of salvation, did many signs and wonders, and yet the vast majority of Jewish people rejected him. John 1 verse 11 tells us, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now it wasn't until Joseph here had died that the people multiplied and filled the line, the land. And we see a great parallel here in the New Testament because when the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again and poured out his spirit, and not until that point, the gospel spread like wildfire. The Lord Jesus had predicted in John 12, 24, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And you remember what happened, I'm sure, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in that upper room. They began to speak the gospel in languages which they hadn't learnt. People from all nations who'd come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost celebrations heard the news of the gospel in their own language. The apostles, this, this timid band, were suddenly given a new boldness to preach Jesus Christ, particularly Peter, who had previously denied him. That day, around 3,000 souls, we were told, were saved, and the church increased daily. From some, some small beginnings, 12 men on a tiny strip of land in the Mediterranean, from such small beginnings, God established his church. So dear friends, we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged because God has a people. The spiritual descendants of Abraham today consist of the church of Jesus Christ. Paul writing to the Galatians in chapter 3 verse 29 says, If you are Christ's, so if you've repented of your sin and you've trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Like the children of Israel, we enjoy God's blessing and protection. Like the children of Israel in Egypt, we dwell in a foreign land, this earth. This earth is not our home, it is just a fleeting temporal state. It is a drop in the, it is, well it is the tiniest drop in the unlimited ocean of eternity, if I can put it like that. We're on a spiritual pilgrimage to glory. But yet, whilst we're on this earth, God has promised to multiply his people and to grow his church. There's a couple of parables in Luke chapter 13. The parables of the mustard seed the parables of the leaven. We don't have time to look at them today, but they emphasize God's kingdom beginning small. No, no seed, we're told, that's smaller than a mustard seed, and yet growing 
exponentially. You see, God's purpose is to cause his church to increase, to be fruitful, to multiply, to grow <coughs> today. We need to be careful here. It's not about getting bodies on seats at any price. It's not about watering things down to make ourselves acceptable to the world. It's about making disciples. You see, God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And one day we will see it and participate in it. Some wonderful verses in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, where John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Well, this should encourage us in our evangelism, in our prayers for the lost, in our personal witness, in, in visitation, in all our gospel endeavours. God is building his church. He has sent his son to die for his people. And God will not, God, if I can put it like this, God will not be content until all his people are gathered in. We should be encouraged. Well, we've considered the promise of growth. Now let's think a bit about the enemy of growth. Because in verses 8 to 14 of Exodus chapter 1, we see what is Satan's objective, which is simply to destroy God's people. In verses 8 to 10, we see some strategies that he employs. In verse 8, we read this. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. A new king came along. He didn't know Joseph personally. He didn't know what Joseph had done to save the nation from famine. He didn't know the role that Joseph had played in increasing the land's prosperity by trading the grain with the foreign nations. But more importantly than that, this new king did not know the God of Joseph. And because he did not know the God of Joseph, he was ignorant, entirely ignorant of God's word. He was ignorant of the fact that God had promised that he would make a nation of the people of Israel. And so he failed completely to grasp the significance of the presence of Israel in his land. He saw them as a threat to his sovereignty. He saw them as a threat to national security. And so he wanted to get rid of them shrewdly. What a contrast that is, you see, because God's people were previously enjoying that life in Egypt. The famine was over. They were benefiting from the comforts and security of a new land. <clears throat> but now, 350 years, getting on for 400 years after their, their arrival, there's a turning point. A new king who did not know Joseph and who did not know the God of Joseph. The friends now become foes. Well, Psalm 83, verses 3 and 4 speaks about this. It says, they have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Now this isn't about some insecure king. This is about Satan's opposition to the people of God. And we need to remember that we have an enemy. Remember that promise we talked about towards the beginning in Genesis 3.15 that there would be um, enmity from now on between the devil and between the seed, between the devil and Jesus Christ, but between uh, the devil and the people of God. And we, as, as we've seen as God's people, are, are, are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. We're in a foreign land. We're in our Egypt, as it were. It's not our home. And over this Egypt that we're in, the devil has arisen. It's not his by right. It's quite significant, isn't it, that it was during the time of blessing 
that the new king arose. And very often it's during times of, of blessing in churches that opposition comes against us. And difficulties and trials arise. We must expect opposition and, and hindrances where there has been blessing. The Apostle Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And Paul tells us as well that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. So what are his devices? Well, first of all, he, he, sorry, he misrepresents God's people as being a threat to the nation, just like this king did. You may remember the, the story of Esther. And in chapter 3 of Esther, Haman is outraged that Mordecai, the faithful Jew, would not bow down and pay homage to him. And so instead of dealing with Mordecai personally, Haman decides to wipe out the Jews. He seeks the king's approval by misrepresenting them as a threat to the Persian nation. He says in Esther 3 verse 8, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed amongst the people in all the providence, provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain unless you... Now I'm sure he plotted to destroy the Jews and it backfired on him massively. Evangelical Christians today are often branded as fundamentalists. And the word is not used in the sense of meaning people who, uh, who believe the Bible is the word of God and, and seek to apply it in their lives. It's used in a very negative sense to mean uh, an intolerant, bigoted people. That's how we are misrepresented today. Another misrepresentation, or rather another tactic the devil uses, is simply to hold us back in our walk and in our witness. In verse 11 of Exodus 1, we read that the Egyptian rulers set taskmasters over the people of Israel to afflict them with their burdens. They put them under false labour. They were required to build cities. They were required to build a, a, a place where Egyptian provisions and military hardware were stored. The work was hard. The work was long. And that's a tactic that the, the devil seeks to use against us. He seeks to enslave us so that our walk and our witness are hindered. How does he do that? Well, by making our besetting sins seem so attractive by working in us a, a lack of assurance. Often it's working within us a lack of joy. There have been plenty of times when I've preached in churches where I've looked out into the congregation and if you don't mind me saying it, it doesn't apply here. It doesn't apply here, okay. It's, <laughs> and you'll see why I'm saying that. It's like looking out into a sea of slapped backsides. <laughs> You'll never get that image out of your head. The lack of joy <coughs> is, is palpable. Of course, uh, he's, he's best tactic because he can never uh, he can never take away our salvation. But perhaps his best tactic is to to induce us to backslide completely, to find the things of Christ so unattractive, and to to wander away until that point when the Lord has exercises great discipline upon us and brings us back. But the point is that he, he makes us seem so joyless, uh, so ineffectual, that unbelievers see the Christian life either as something completely miserable and that they wouldn't want to touch with a barge pole, or as something that's no different from the world. But if you can't get us like that, his final tactic, I would suggest, is, is to break us. In verses 13 and 14, we read, The Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with vigour, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. Pharaoh 
sought to make the Israelites broken in spirit by such hard work. He would ruin their health, he would shorten their lifespan and thereby diminish their numbers. That, that was the idea. And Satan seeks to break us down, doesn't he? Sometimes it's open persecution, it can be victimisation at work or at home. It can be uh, an intellectual victimisation, the, the, the atheistic agenda and various other agendas that are, are constantly asserted and pressed upon us. And these things may well increase. We could see restrictions on open air preaching. We could see restrictions on church gatherings. We could see restrictions on preaching the exclusivity of Christ. Probably 25, 30 years or so ago, we, we wouldn't have thought that, but it, it doesn't, perhaps doesn't seem all that far-fetched now. And yet, we should take heart. We should take heart because it was God's will for his people to be enslaved and persecuted in Egypt. Back in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, God said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants, and that's speaking of the children of Israel here in Exodus chapter 1, will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them. And they will afflict them for 400 years, and also the nation whom they serve I will judge. They will come out with great possessions. And if you know the story of the Exodus, that's exactly what happened. See, times of affliction have often been the times of growth within the church. Christianity spreads, not when it is a, is a, is a comfortable, easy, social churchianity. Christianity spreads when it is persecuted. As was once said, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Verse 12 here is amazing. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And it would follow perhaps that if we expect to see church growth generally and also church growth locally, we must expect more persecution of whatever sort that might take. But let us not fear, because in the words of Psalm 2, verse 1, those who plot against the Lord and his people imagine a vain thing. So we've seen the promise of growth, the enemy of growth, and now finally, the source of growth. And that's in verses 15 to 21 of Exodus chapter 1. Well, the king's plans have not succeeded. The people of God have continued to grow. Satan won't give up, of course. He's still bent on extinguishing the people of God and to make sure that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, can never appear on the earth. And so he approached, and so the king approaches two midwives, probably uh, superintendents of a, a wider, a wider group, and he orders them to kill the boys. <coughs> to kill the boys. Why only the boys? Well, it's the males who would grow up to be the soldiers and would be liable to fight the Egyptians. But principally, of course, it was an attempt, as we've said, by the devil to prevent the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, from coming into the world. As you know, I'm sure, when Jesus was born and Herod the king was felt threatened by his coming into the world, he also ordered the death of all the male children. Satan simply doesn't give up. But we're told in verse 17 that midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. This was not a lie on the part of the midwives, because if it was, God would not have commended them. God was directly involved in the, in the birth 
and the national growth of the nation. The Hebrew women knew unusual blessing and they gave birth with ease before the midwives got there. You see, there was nothing that the king could do and there was nothing that Satan could do to thwart God's promises. God rewarded, we're told in, in verse 20, he rewarded these midwives with uh, houses, family, security, the people multiplied and grew very mightily. Do you remember how the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in the wilderness after those 40 days and 40 nights of fasting? Satan came to him, promising him various things, and yet how the Saviour prevailed in such difficult circumstances. We too need to remain faithful to God. We need to be like these midwives who feared God. Proverbs 14 verse 26 says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 22 4, By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life. We need to be like these insignificant midwives who understood the promises and purposes of God. Think as well of, of Daniel's friends. You may remember Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had decreed that when the music played, everyone must bow down and worship the, the golden image, and those who don't would be thrown into the fiery furnace. And yet, Dan, and yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the king and said, If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. God will honour those who fear him. God will reward faithful service. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 12, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet surely I know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. Insignificant midwives versus a significant Pharaoh. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God spared the little boys of Israel but he spared not his own dear son to save us. That's how much our God loves us. So dear friends, as we conclude, yes, we live in dark and barren times. We may pray for revival. We may engage in evangelism. We may preach the gospel. And yet it's so easy to become a Christian cynic. Why? Because we forget the promises of God. And because we forget the promises of God, we allow the enemy to gain ground. And when he gains ground, we may become so discouraged that we lose our grip on God. But let's remember, God has not finished building his church yet. We've seen a promise of growth that should encourage us to persist and persevere in making disciples. We've seen the enemy of growth that should make us wise about his tactics. We've seen the source of growth. Fearing God and standing for him. In heaven we will experience the kingdom of God in all its fullness. It is only God who saves. But it's us whom he uses as his, his instruments. Let's believe his promises. Let's stand firm against the enemy. Let's fear God. Maybe these little drips that are coming through the, the, the ceiling into the bowls. May they even be uh, perhaps a... Uh, uh, an emblem of showers of blessing that are to come to us in the future. Who knows? Don't be a cynic. May God be pleased to bless us with exponential growth and a harvest of souls and disciples greater than we can imagine. May he have all the honour, all the glory and all the praise. Amen. Before we close, we'll sing our final hymn this morning. If you're using the hymn books, it's 765. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his <coughs> other lives to bring?